Hi, my name is Dave Knight. I am the chef owner of KiltedChefLLC.com. Today we're going to be blending sweet and savory ingredients and this comes from influences I've had with my travels throughout the world. First thing we're going to make is a pizza appetizer. It's going to be a blackberry, basil, goat cheese and pine nut pizza finished with agave drizzle and a beechwood smoked salt. Our main entree is going to be a bison filet rolled in honey candied pistachio, served with a togarachi chocolate spice, mesquite powder honey butter, and topped with a French macaron that is made with smoked vanilla bean and smoked telecherry peppercorns. Our final dessert is going to be a tres leches cake stuffed poblano, and we're basically making a dessert rellenos and rolling it in pecans and almonds, deep frying it and serving it warm. Without any further ado, let's get started on making the pizza. Today we're making pizza, not just your typical pizza, but a blackberry, basil, goat cheese pizza with pine nuts, agave drizzle, and smoked beechwood salt. So I want to start out with making the dough. So the first type of dough we're going to make is very, very simple. It's using a, what's called a straight dough method, okay? And this is layering your water and your yeast. So water in first, drizzle the yeast over the top. Since I'm mixing the dough with my hand, I'm just going to use my hands to kind of blend the yeast in. Now for the straight dough method, we want to create a barrier between the yeast and the salt. And we're going to use the flour to do that. So sprinkle your flour over the top of your water and yeast, and then your salt. And the reason we do this is if we add salt directly to the yeast, the salt will kill the yeast. And then, so if you've ever had problems with your dough not rising, this is most likely why, okay? Or your, other, your yeast is just old. So we want to give it a stir, just a gentle stir. And once I've got those ingredients mixed, I'm going to add two tablespoons of olive oil. Bring the dough together and all I'm doing is stirring it around. I'm going to give it a squeeze. Now I used an instant yeast, so you don't need any rest time. You don't need to let it sit and rehydrate. With a dry active yeast, you'd want to let it sit for at least 10 minutes. So I'm pressing the dough down folding from the outside in. So once the dough starts to come together, you'll notice that a lot of the flour and dough that was on my hands has come off. That's a good sign that the dough is starting to come together. I'll give it a good knead for about two minutes by hand. Now if you have a KitchenAid mixer uh, with a dough hook attachment or a mixer of any kind, bread machine, this should take, I don't know, two minutes at most from start to finish. I just want to make sure I knead it enough to develop a good gluten content. And the gluten is the elasticity in the dough. Think of it as the uh, muscle fibers in your arm, okay? And you're, and you're working those out. So, once the dough comes together, you notice that the dough has completely cleaned the bowl. That way I know the dough is done. There's my finished dough. It's good and elastic. Now, once you start pulling it apart and it starts to tear, that means I'm about done kneading, okay? If I go too far, the dough will start ripping and I'm overdeveloping the gluten structure on it. All right, I have a dough already made, ready to go to show you how to roll this pizza out. Now, I wanna take some more olive oil, parchment paper, spread that out. Don't be scared to play with your food. I encourage it. Olive oil is good for the skin. And just drop your dough right in the middle and just kind of gently press it out from the center out. You don't need a rolling pin. Uh, if you want to roll this out and don't have a rolling pin, you can always use a wine bottle of some kind. I like to do it all by hand. I like to feel my food, get my hands in there, know what the structure is. As you can see, it's not perfect. If it doesn't come out perfect, just call it artisan and charge more. All right, so to go with the ingredients, a little bit more olive oil on top. Again, use your fingers, it's just very light. This will keep the dough from burning in spots, cover any dry dough you might have, okay? We're gonna start with our goat cheese first. And just kind of break it up over the surface. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just don't wanna get big clumps of goat cheese in one area. All right, just sprinkle the goat cheese on. Make sure you cover the surface of the pizza. Any wide areas you have on the edge of the dough, will just be that, just dough. So we want to try and cover as much of it as we can, as even as possible. Goat cheese doesn't really break up that well. If you keep it really cold, it handles better, okay? All right, next on, 
we're gonna go with pine nuts, okay? These are just whole pine nuts. You can chop them up uh, any way you want. Um, I like them whole. And again, just a light sprinkle. Obviously, if you have a nut allergy, don't use any nuts. Okay, next, blackberries. I cut these in half. I do them face up. And again, as you're putting these on the pizza, just try not to clump them all in one area. Now, one of the influences for this style of pizza, uh, I grew up in the Middle East, in Iran, uh, spending every summer there. My mother was from Iran, and it was the experience of going to the open markets and the sights and the sounds and the smells and just fresh produce everywhere. So we always had fresh goat cheese, fresh pistachios. Um, you can certainly do this pizza with pistachios. I just chose pine nuts because it's a little lighter. Uh, I thought it went well with the blackberries. We've got our goat cheese, we've got our pine nuts, we've got our blackberries. The last thing we need is our basil. Now, if you notice, the way I have this set up with uh, the knife, blade always facing away from me. That way, if I'm sweeping my hand across my cutting board, I don't accidentally hit the blade, okay? Or I hit the back, the spine of the blade. Now, you wanna make sure the knife has a very, very sharp blade, all right? So when I'm cutting things, fragile things like basil, um, I'm not mashing the cells and it'll turn black really quick. If I'm slicing through the cells, it'll stay green longer. And again, good long slicing motion. Don't just go straight down. This is where uh, a lot of students just coming into the field make mistakes, is they think they need to push through the ingredient, then they hang that one finger out there and take it off. We don't want that. All right, fresh basil. All right, this is how we're gonna bake the pizza right here, okay? Just like that, as is. When this is done baking, I've got agave syrup and a smoked beechwood salt. Now, the beechwood smoked salt, I made myself. So, and this is just by putting salt in a smoker with beechwood to help induce that flavor. And that's what kind of turns it that blackish color. It's got a really good smoky quality to it, which is gonna add a nice texture in contrast to the goat cheese, okay, as far as aromatics and flavor go, all right? Let's grab our pizza and see how it looks. Now, I did bake this at 425 degrees for about 20 minutes until I saw that nice golden crust. Okay, I don't want to get it too dark because then it dries the dough out. All right, and there's our finished product, okay? Notice how the dough has proofed around the blackberries. All right, so what we want to do now, take our beechwood salt, just real light because remember, it is technically still a salt, all right? And just a nice agave drizzle. And agave is a little less sweet than honey, so it's not gonna make it really, really sweet, and we don't want that. And there's your pizza. For our next recipe, we're gonna make a bison dish, okay? And this inspiration comes from living in Colorado. Uh, we do have buffalo and bison all over the place. So Colorado is known for its beef, uh, as well as its bison. It's starting to get known for its ostrich and emu as well. But today I figured I'd bring something native Colorado out here to New York, and we're gonna do a bison dish. So this particular bison dish is gonna start, but we're gonna make a chocolate sauce, okay? We've got water. I use a Dutch processed cocoa powder as opposed to a lighter cocoa powder. I like the heavier chocolate flavor. And this is a really easy sauce. Just put everything in a pot, turn it on. Sugar. Now you're saying, why am I making a dessert sauce for bison? Uh, we are gonna kick this up with some togarachi spice, which is an Asian spice that you'll typically find on sushi. Uh, they'll sprinkle a little bit over the top. That'll give it kind of a little bit of a chili pepper kick, okay? I do have fresh vanilla bean. I'm gonna put that right in there. And then the togarachi spice. How easy this recipe is, again, combine everything in the pot, just turn it on. We're gonna put it on a low heat, okay? Make sure you get a whisk in there. Just give it a stir. You wanna make sure you stir it so that way the sugar isn't sitting at the bottom against the heat or else then it burns. Once it's stirred together, we're gonna to move on to the bison. The lumps will eventually come out of there. All right, let's get 
that one on high, get it preheated. I've got a little bit of olive oil over here. Now for a bison, just regular salt. Give it a little bit of season. Now I like to season it and let it sit, okay? Just with the salt. That way the salt has kind of time to dissolve as well as sink in and flavor the meat a little better. While we're letting this sit, we're gonna make a crust for the bison, okay? And not like a coffee crust, um, I've had that in restaurants. Uh, we're gonna do whole pistachios and some fresh honey. This is a local unpasteurized honey. Um, I do believe in supporting local beekeepers in our area and we have plenty of them in the Colorado area. Just stir that together. Now you can coat this in a little bit of egg white, just enough to create a kind of a wet appearance on the, on the whatever nut, whether it's pistachios, walnuts, pecans, whatever you want to use, and then dump in granulated sugar and the egg whites will help it stick to the nuts. Here I'm using honey. I like the flavor of honey. All right, so then that would just go onto a sheet pan with parchment paper, baking paper. And then this goes in the oven at 325 degrees until you start to smell the nuts, okay? I leave the nuts whole, and then once they come out, that's what they're, they're gonna look like. It's just gonna be a big cluster. And with that, then you just take your knife and gently run your knife across it. Again, just watch your fingers. If your knife is very, very sharp like mine are, safety first above all else. Now again, this is gonna be a dish that's re involving a blend of sweet and savory, okay? Pistachios from the Middle East, fresh honey from local beekeepers, bison from Colorado. Okay, I put the finished chopped nuts in a wider dish because I wanna roll the sides of the bison once I get it seared in this. Now, again, with the sweet and savory, a little bit of pepper on both sides. I do the pepper at the last minute if pepper sits, it starts to get a little bitter. We don't want that. All right, so we got our pan nice and hot, a little bit of smoke coming off it. Just a little bit of oil. Move that around. Get that nice sear. When you're searing a piece of meat, you want to hear that sound, okay? If not, your heat's too low. Now, the longer you leave your, the piece of meat in the pan, the less time in the oven. We're going for a medium rare, so we're looking at about five minutes total in the pan and probably about that long in the oven, okay? When I pull it out of the oven, I wanna let it rest. The reason I wanna let it rest is the heat's forcing all the juices to the middle. If I just go put it on the plate, all the juices come back out and leak all over the plate, and you have a bloody mess on the plate. By letting it rest, basically take it off, put it on a plate, just give it time for those juices to expand. It's got a nice sear, good color on it. I use my fingers a lot. I wash my hands a lot. And it's only skin, it'll grow back, right? I went to two culinary schools. Um, I was actually working in a bakery deli. And we had a French pastry chef that worked there that was doing this amazing pulled sugar basket. And I saw that and it was just it blew my mind that you could do that with sugar. Two really good friends of mine I grew up with had just signed up for culinary school and I decided right there on the spot that's what I wanted to do. So I went to culinary school for a year, studied under a master pastry chef and loved it so much. Six months later I went back to culinary school to get my associates in culinary arts and have been doing this a little over 30 years, the last seven of it teaching culinary arts. And by teaching culinary arts, it really, really helped me expand on my knowledge of sweet and savory and not just how to cook foods, but why foods cook. All right, we got a good crust on the side of the filet. Put that right back in the pan because we're gonna go in the oven with it, with the pan. Do the second one. And if we need, once it's done cooking, we can always add some more to it. All right, this goes in the oven. And we'll give that about five minutes to get to about a medium rare. And when we come back, we're gonna show you how to plate this up, okay? All right, let's check on these steaks. See how they're doing. All right, let's get the burnt nuts out of the way. 
All right, steaks look ready. So while those are resting, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the plating. Now, this is our chocolate sauce with togarachi. So the togarachi, again, it's like chocolate and chilies, okay? Um, it's gonna have a little bit of kick to it. So I'm gonna take a little bit right in the bottom of the plate. We don't wanna have too much. I don't wanna create a pool in the bottom of the plate, but I also wanna make sure I have enough for both of the fillets. Let me go with this one first, it's a little flatter. I'm gonna use this one to prop this one up. Just like so, leave that in the plate. Now, to go along with the sweet and savory concept, what I've got here is a honey butter seasoned with mesquite powder, okay? And these have been kept in the fridge and the reason I keep them in the fridge is they're gonna melt over the hot filet, okay? And basically help create a sauce. And it's also gonna add a richness to the chocolate sauce, all right? What I have here is a French macaron. This one here, I put teletary black peppercorns and vanilla bean in a smoker and then made a paste out of it, okay? And that's what these French macarons are seasoned with. Otherwise, it's just a plain French macaron recipe, okay? I'm gonna prop one on that, a little bit of butter. As you can tell, I like butter. And just a little bit of the nuts as a garnish, and there's your finished dish. All right, for dessert, we're gonna make a version of uh, a rianos. This is a postre rianos or a pastry rianos. Uh, we're gonna take and stuff roasted poblanos with tres leches cake. We're gonna roll them in pecans and almonds and then deep fry it. The cake inside is gonna become nice and warm, basically create its own sauce. So you're not really gonna need a sauce with it. You can serve it with a tequila anglaise, but it's completely unnecessary. One of my inspirations for this is my wife and I had a pastry shop in Colorado in the mountains of Bailey and we supported local homestead farms who raise chickens for our eggs. Uh, we support local beekeepers for our honey. We also had a cow share where we were getting our own fresh milk, unpasteurized with the cream, making our own butter and dairy products. Uh, always trying to support local as well as support a healthier way of life. Okay. Uh, right now, I am the chef and owner of KiltedChefLLC.com, where we make a organic honey candy. We have 22 flavors of honey candy. Uh, we've, we are in nine stores right now in the Colorado area and slowly expanding. Uh, we also make a, six flavors of beef jerky and 80 flavors of fudge, using as many organic fresh ingredients that we can. Okay. Again, you can find me on KiltedChefLLC.com. Um, today, <coughs> Again, we're gonna do the postre rellenos. So the first thing we're gonna do is make a cake, okay? The cake is really, really easy. First thing you wanna do is take your flour, baking powder. Just make sure they're stirred together really well so you don't get a pocket of baking powder. Now, for any of you interested in actually trying to grind your own or mill your own flours, uh, you have a hard spring wheat, okay, or winter wheat, which has the higher protein content, which is better for breads and pastry crusts, and then you have a spring wheat berry. The spring wheat berry has a lower protein content, which is great for cakes and flours and uh, cookies, things like that. Uh, the berry itself, if you do not grind it, has an unlimited shelf life. That's the great thing about it. It's about a third the cost of a bag of flour you get from the store. And once you grind it and you combine all those healthy ingredients, the germ, the bran, and the fiber, you have to use it right away or freeze it or else it'll start to rot, okay? But it's not impossible to do. It's really, really easy to grind your own flour or obtain it. Um, it is becoming not so much of a trend as it is people are discovering that this is actually a healthier way of life, okay? Uh, and that's what we're trying to shoot for here along with making fun flavors. Um, one of the philosophies I have as a chef and an owner of a business is you're only limited to your imagination, okay? Anything goes. If you wanna have fun with it, have fun with it. My kids love a peanut butter, marshmallow fluff, and banana sandwich. I think it's the grossest thing in the world. They'll eat them all day long, okay? I think it's just the sugar, but whatever makes them happy. So we've got our flour combined, okay? The next thing we wanna do is divide up our sugar. 
three fourths of the content of the sugar is going to go into the egg whites. The rest of it's going to go into the egg yolks. Okay. Now we don't want to get any of the egg yolks into the egg whites. All right. Fat will kill a meringue. All right. So any fats, oils, make sure your bowl is clean. Let's do the egg whites first because then I can take my whisk and go straight into the egg yolks. I don't have to constantly wash anything. And for those of you who missed your workout this morning, here it is. I could use a KitchenAid, but David Crockett didn't have one, so I won't use one either. Now while I'm doing this in front of you, you'll see two poblano peppers. These are these larger peppers, very mild heat, okay? And this is typically used in a Riano's dish. Um, what I've done is I rubbed them with the oil and I put them directly on the burners and turned the fire on, charred them all the way around, put them in a bowl, cover them with plastic wrap, let it steam, and that will help take the skin off or the outer skin, and that's all there is to it. All right, now that we're done whisking our meringue, we've whisked our egg yolks until they're light and yellow and fluffy. This is five eggs separated, one cup of sugar, three-fourths of the cup in the egg whites, one-fourth into the egg yolks. Now what we want to do is take our one cup of all-purpose flour, one and a half teaspoons of baking powder that we've combined together, add that to the egg yolks. Gently, with the whisk, we want to try not to lose a lot of volume here. So I'm being real, real gentle. You can see it's kind of picked it all up. And get it out of the whisk. Switch to a spatula and gently fold. And you can see it's kind of thickened it up, made a paste with it. We want to lighten that up with one third cup of milk. Again, I'm trying to do this without losing too much volume. Again, get underneath it, flip it over. All right, everything's incorporated. Now I'm gonna take my meringue and incorporate this one third at a time into my egg yolks. So the first third, I expect to lose some volume. The second third, it's gonna start helping build volume back. And the last third will add a lot of volume to it. Next third. And again, in the stages that you add them don't have to be exactly equal. Approximately counts. A lot of people think baking is, is an exact science and it's really not. Close counts. Again, get your spatula underneath, flip it over and fold. You can see it's incorporating it and how much lighter it's getting. And this should do it here. And you can see in adding it in three stages, it's really lighting the batter up. And this is gonna be the base for our cake. We're gonna bake this in a 10 inch pan at 325 degrees for approximately 25 minutes. And I say approximately because everyone's oven is different. If you're using convection oven or conventional oven, uh, electric heat, gas heat, it's all gonna be different, but roughly 25 minutes, okay? Now what I'm looking for in my finished product is this ribbon stage. See how it's holding that ribbon on top of the batter before it starts to blend in? And it just kind of sits there? That's what I'm looking for. If it blends in too fast, the batter is probably a little bit too thin bake it anyway, go with it and have fun. All right, the cake is pulled away from the sides. It's got a nice golden color on top. It's got a nice spring to it, so I know it's done, okay? You can also stick a fork into this or a knife into it, pull it out. If it comes out clean, it's done, or a toothpick as well. At this stage, what we want to do for the tres leches cake is I've got one can of evaporated milk, one can of condensed milk, and one third cup of heavy cream to create the tres leches, or the three milks. And we're just gonna pour this over the top and let it soak in. And if you notice how it went down, the cake is dry enough where it's literally soaking it up like a sponge, and that's what we want, okay? So it'll produce a nice, nice creamy cake. All right, let's set this aside for right now, let that soak in. Poblanos, again, very mild pepper, very large pepper. These were brushed with oil, placed right on top of the burner, high flame, roasted them until they're black, put in a bowl covered with saran wrap and let them sit for about 20 minutes and they'll steam the outer skin off. And then I scraped all the outer skin off, okay? There's a little bit right there we can get rid of. What I wanna do now is split it open on one side 
okay? I want to take all the seeds out from the middle. There's a couple left in here. If you can see right at the top in this little cone here is where all the seeds are gonna hang out, okay? So I just stick my fingers up in there and just kind of pull them all off and they fall right out. You can do this under running water and it'll help wash them out. Just make sure you take a towel and get as much moisture out of the poblano as possible, okay? So I've got my cake. Gently hold your pepper, split open, and in little spoonfuls, kind of chop it up and we're gonna stuff it. Now you can add rum to the milk mixture. You don't have to. If your family's anything like mine, I'll probably get yelled at for not adding it. Now don't overstuff it because we have to close this back up, okay? So gently pull, just kind of press and squeeze. And this is what it should look like when we're done. We should be able to basically fill it and stuff it and get the general shape of the pepper back, okay? Now we go to a breading procedure. One way to make the breading procedure really easy is to freeze this first, because then it'll hold its shape better. For the sake of the show, we're just gonna go for it, okay? So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna carefully dredge this into flour, okay? Coat the whole thing in flour. Make sure you get it tucked up in, every little nook and cranny. Gently knock it off, any excess. After the flour, I've got just an egg that's whisked. And now we're gonna roll it in that. Gonna make sure we're holding our shape. And that's what it looks like after the egg mix. Now, we're gonna go into pecans and almond blend. Okay, these are just lightly crushed. They're not really chopped. I just wanna carefully roll it and just cover it, coat it. Get it to stick as best as possible. Again, this works a whole lot better when it's frozen because then your egg wash <coughs> will, will kind of get really, really cold and stick to it better as well as help the nut mixture stick to it better. Okay, so now that we've got that, we're gonna go into the fryer in a pot of oil behind me. If you have a tabletop fryer, that works great. Pot of oil, 325 degrees, real gentle. Uh, we wanna go with a lighter side of the fryer, uh, lower side temperature so we don't burn all the nuts, okay? So let's go into the frying oil. Now, I've got this temped at about 325 degrees. Uh, you wanna be really gentle. I'm gonna do this with my hands now. If you're nervous about doing this part, put this on a slotted spoon and gently lower it in, okay? Make sure we keep our area clean. All right, and what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the color on the almonds because the almonds are much whiter than the pecan, so I'm gonna be able to tell with the almonds. And as they start to get golden, then I'll roll it. And it takes literally about 30 seconds each side before I flip it. It goes pretty quick. The cake's already cooked. It's already soaked in the tres leches milks, the three milks. Poblano's already cooked, so all you need to do is get a little bit of color on the outside. It'll be enough to heat up the cake on the inside. I'm gonna use a towel in my dish to absorb any excess oil. And that's all there is to it. It goes pretty quick. And there's your poblano stuffed with tres leches cake. All right, so to plate the poblano, all I did was make a regular chocolate sauce, just like I did for the bison, but without the togarachi spice. There's the poblano on the plate. I'm gonna present it with the nice side up and just back and forth on the plate for a quick decoration. And the plate is done. And there's your dessert. Thank you for joining us on this episode where we combine sweet and savory flavors. My name's Dave Knight. You can follow me on KiltedChefLLC.com. Join us next episode where we're gonna take an American classic and Indian flavors and make a curry apricot carrot cake. Don't forget, you're only limited to your imagination.